Colony 9 the Compass Quad and this is our final project. My name is Abby. My name is Michael Nath. Hey, my name is Kevin Fu. And my name is Sarah Winier. And today we are going to be addressing the question of how can we find transcription factor binding sites lurking in the upstream regions of genes? So I'm going to begin by taking our question down a step and explaining what transcription factor binding sites are and why it is important that we utilize technologies that can locate them. A transcription factor is responsible for governing the way that genes are transcribed and analyzed. To formulate a better understanding of this principle, I'm going to show you how these transcription factors enable the upregulation of a gene that is extremely prevalent in cancer. Today, I'm going to be referencing a gene called HER2, which transcribes a certain protein known to control the spread and growth of cancer and plays an important role in the pathogenesis of various solid tumors, particularly in breast and ovarian cancers. So to begin, I'm going to explain how transcription factor binding sites work to activate this gene. We start with a DNA strand that has two regions included, known as the promoter and the enhancer. The promoter is usually upstream to the gene, while the enhancer is farther away. In order for the activated complex to form, these two regions must be brought together by an elaborate loop. Through a cascade of signaling, the transcription factors in mediator complex are activated. This complex is responsible for governing the way that genes are transcribed and RNA polymerase is recruited. Once the DNA opens, the binding proteins, which are the transcription factors and mediator complex, enter to form an activation complex and stabilize the enhancer and promoter regions. This is one of the key components that transcription factors do, is stabilize the DNA for the RNA polymerase to come in. Essentially, they enable the RNA pol polymerase to do its job. By doing this, they create an enhanced area where you'll see a stronger expression of this HER2 gene. Without these transcription factor binding sites, low levels will be seen. Following this, RNA polymerase is able to come in and read the gene, where it then turns the double-stranded DNA into copies called pre-mRNAs. These pre-mRNAs carry instructions for the building of the HER2 protein. Within the nucleus, these pre-mRNAs are cleaned up with some sections removed, then they exit the nuclear pore as mRNA, where they begin the process of synthesizing the protein associated with the HER2 gene. This process all creates an upregulation of this gene. It is important to note the effect of this upregulation of the gene HER2. In this situation, it would denote that the cancer is likely spreading through the ovarian or breast regions of the person analyzed. Initially, some transcription factor binding sites repress the HER2 gene, which could likely indicate that the cancer activity has decreased. The importance of being able to detect these binding sites lies in the fact that we are able to better define biological pathways. So now we are going to show you how this is done. Hey, it's Michael here. There are a couple of methods to determine the transcription factor binding site. Some of these involve experimental approaches, while others are more computationally focused. Some of these methods are in vitro, meaning they happen outside of organisms. Others are in vivo, meaning they happen inside of organisms. One in vitro method is the EMSA assay. This assay requires the use of gel electrophoresis, which is a way of separating various DNA fragments by how long they are. The key insight is that if you have two identical fragments, you can make one heavier by attaching a protein to it, and then it will migrate less to the gel than the lighter one. If we tag that specific protein, which are, in our case is a transcription factor, we can see the general binding site and location of our transcription factor binding site. The in vivo method is called the CHIP method or the chromatin amino precipitation method. In this method, proteins get forcefully bound to the sequence of DNA that it interacts with. Antibodies come in and bind to the protein of interest which in our case is a transcription factor. The antibody, along with the protein, DNA, and the bead the antibody is attached to, precipitates down into the solution, and you can now extract and isolate the sequence and see what it is. The last approach is more computationally oriented, and it implements something known as a position-weight matrix. 
using binding motifs and pattern matching from results of the EMSA assay or the chip method. A matrix can be derived that describes the most common nucleotide that would appear in a given position. It mentions the second or third most common nucleotide, or in our case, the difference between the first or second could be a matter of single digits. The matrix can be converted from a raw frequency to one fine-tuned to a background matrix, allowing for a more accurate score to be calculated. Scores are calculated in this fine-tuned in fine form by adding up corresponding nucleotide scores in each column. If score is equal to zero, then the likelihood of the sequence being functional versus being random is equally likely. If it's less than zero, then it's more likely random. If it's greater than zero, it's more likely to be a functional sequence and significant. Unlike other kinds of matrices, the position matrix allows for variability and it has a very accurate way of determining the score or the accuracy of a given read to the actual binding site sequence. The position weight matrix is powerful, but it has to be created or derived from experimental approaches. There are two variants to the chip method. The first variant is known as a chip on chip method, where it uses the immune precipitation idea but now it adds a microarray implementation. The chip sec or chip sequencing method is, a, is the second variant, and it also uses the chip method, but it adds high throughput sequencing. Each method has its own advantages and disadvantages, and Abby will go over them. In our video, we decided to focus on chip sec. Now that Michael's talked a bit about the differences between ChipSeq and ChipOnChip, chip, let's talk about why ChipSeq is a better or more commonly used method than ChipOnChip. ChipSeq chip can rapidly decode millions of DNA fragments simultaneously with high efficiency and relatively low cost compared to ChipOnChip. Chip. Since ChipSeq provides the actual DNA sequences of the precipitated fragments, the, d the data obtained is of higher resolution, more accurate, and more quantitative than ChipOnChip. Chip. Now let's go into what ChipSeq is and how it functions. Essentially, ChipSeq is used to isolate and transcribe genes bound by a particular protein. When scientists want to identify the specific DNA sequence for a protein, such as a transcription factor, they can use ChipSeq to do so. <clears throat> First in the process, they use formaldehyde or a similar substance to glue all proteins bound to the DNA of the organism that they're investigating together with the DNA. Then they cut the DNA into small, approximately 300 base pair fragments. Then they isolate the protein of interest using the antibody and wash everything else away. After that, they reverse the formaldehyde glue by warming everything up. Then they isolate the DNA itself by washing the proteins away. Next, they prepare a sequencing library in six steps. First, they add sequencing adapters to both ends of all DNA fragments. Second, they use polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, to amplify the library. Third, they verify the library concentration and the reads lengths. Then they sequence the reads, which is something that we've been doing in class. Usually, they use a position weight matrix, like Michael mentioned. After that, they filter out garbage reads, which are reads with low-quality base calls that might have mi been misread, or reads that are just two sequencing adapters stuck together. Lastly, they align the high-quality reads to a genome. The very last step in ChipSeq is to create a genome browser track, which shows the commonality of the specific gene you've isolated along the entire ge genome. When a transcription factor protein has been identified, ChipSeq can be used to locate its binding site. We understand that ChipSeq is a complicated process and can be hard to visualize. So to go back to something that Sarah mentioned at the beginning of this video, let's take a look at the HER2 gene. As she detailed, HER2 controls cancer growth and spread, primarily in breast and ovarian cancer cells. In 2017, researchers at the Carver College of Medicine at the University of Iowa used ChipSeq to locate HER2's transcription factor binding site. In doing so, they were able to find an important regulator that could enhance HER2's expression in breast cancer samples. By analyzing the expression of HER2 in breast cancer cells, scientists and medical professionals are now better equipped to develop and prescribe new treatments to patients.
Alright, and for the last part of this video, I'll be talking about problems that can occur during chipset experiments. One problem that occurs during chipset experiments are phantom peaks. These are essentially false peaks that occur in chipset data. Phantom peaks occur due to high occupancy sites on the genome, where many proteins can bind to one spot. These sites can create peaks at places in the genome that can be confused for our targeted transcription factor binding sites when they're actually not. One way to solve this problem is through the use of knockout experiments. The target transcription factor can be knocked out and the chipset experiment can be performed. The peaks found in the knockout experiment can be compared with non-knockout data to find phantom peaks. Alternatively, you can use publicly available data on areas where phantom peaks frequently occur to check peaks in the non-knockout experiment. Another problem that may occur are issues with antibody quality. The two main factors that determine an antibody's quality are its specificity and its sensitivity. Specificity refers to the range of proteins an antibody will bind to, and sensitivity refers to how likely an antibody will bind to a target protein. Experiments that have poor antibodies will either have too many non-specific bindings after cross-linking, or will have too few overall bindings to make conclusions. To establish how good an antibody is, Western blotting can be used, which is a laboratory procedure that can be used to detect the types and numbers of proteins an antibody will bind with. Lastly, problems with cross-linking may also occur. The most commonly used cross-linker is formaldehyde, which is good at cross-linking proteins to DNA. However, for certain situations where multiple proteins are involved, other cross-linkers, such as DSG, can improve results. DSG is a good cross-linker for protein-to-protein -protein interactions and can be used in conjunction with formaldehyde to cross-link proteins in DNA. Thanks, Kevin. The big idea here is that these methods have only really been developed because of recent advancements in biology. In the future, methods are always going to be developed. And they're only going to be developed if you continue to persevere in theoretical, computational, and experimental biology. And so it's with that that we, Colin and I, the Compass Squad, sign off. Not for our last time, but rather our first.